Gawain is one of the most well-known knights of the Round Table. He is King Arthur's nephew and is believed to be one of his most loyal and brave warriors. He has appeared regularly in Arthurian legends going back to the 12th century and has one of the largest spin-off libraries of any of Arthur's companions. Today we're going to take a look at Gawain throughout history and discuss his more important aspects and why he is so valuable to King Arthur and his companions. We will look at his appearances in various stories and his many connections to nature and fertility. He has connections to heroes, kings, and gods, so let's explore this very layered warrior of King Arthur's court. Gawain can be boorish, even grumpy at times, but also has that kind of charm that makes people flock to him for protection and comfort. We often see him as a large bull of a man, strong and capable, and a very skilled and inexhaustible fighter. It is Gawain who is usually the first of Arthur's knights to step up and accept a challenge or to defend his king. He is called the Maiden's Knight, being a defender of women and prone to swooning them as well. Being Arthur's nephew and next in line to the throne in many tales, he is constantly proving his worth and valor. He is a skillful knight and well known throughout the lands, even the preferred envoy in the king's stead to many of the lords and ladies in Britain because they know his bravery and chivalry are second only to the king himself. Gawain's mother is Morgos, who is usually portrayed as Arthur's sister or aunt. Sometimes she is also called Anna. His father is King Lot of Lothian, and he and Morgos have many sons, including Gawain, Agravain, Gaheris, Gareth, and occasionally Mordred. Gawain very occasionally has a wife, but more often is a single, chivalrous, and rather lusty knight. Let's take a look at the origins of his name. Gawain is believed to derive from the Welsh character Gwalchme ap Gwiar. Gwalch, meaning hawk, and me, stemming back to me. Many call Gwalchme, or Gawain, the Hawk of May. There is even a series called Down the Long Wind by Gillian Bradshaw about Gwalchme, son of King Lot and Queen Morgos. Their first book in the series is called Hawk of May. The surname Gwiar means gore or bloodshed and likely stems back to Gwalchme's mother, as was typical for those times per the Welsh triad. Another source that Gawain is believed to have stemmed from is Gwalt Avin, which comes from the list of heroes in Kulak and Ulwin, which translates to hair like reins or bright hair. I think many of us who enjoy Gawain's depiction in more modern works can appreciate that reference. Gawain has a horse called Gringolet and he loves him very much. We often see Gawain looking after his horse. Gringolet is a French name, and in Welsh, the horse is called Kain Coled. Gawain won his horse by defeating a giant called Escanor. It is said that Escanor the Large was born at the same time as Gawain and bore a bone-deep hatred of the knight, for he had defeated him before. He shared Gawain's strength, which waxed and waned with the sun. The horse was a gift to Escanor the Large from his lover, the fairy queen Esclaramond. Gringolet was very uncooperative for Gawain until he received help from a maiden called Filanite. She removed a bag of powder from the horse's ear. From then forward, Gawain and Gringolet have been seen together in nearly every story Gawain is featured in. In one tale, Gringolet is killed in battle and Gawain loses his senses in grief and fights savagely until the night falls. Here we can see connections between Gawain and nature, animals, light, and the sun with references to Gawain defeating Escanor in the past and a strong connection to the strength of the sun, we can see the motif of Gawain being built. I also find some connections with the green knight here who is said to be a large green man. Gawain even wears a crown of light in the movie, The Green Knight. The story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is certainly his most famous story. Many of us are familiar with it from childhood. Did you know it was actually anonymously written and the author is still a mystery? I found that to be rather interesting because it is one of the more recognizable Arthurian tales, not simply in reference to Gawain. The story teaches of bravery and valor and the importance of honesty, though it is rather humorous as well. Gawain is Arthur's nephew and a young knight at court. 
At the Christmas feast, a mystery knight in all green appears, riding a green horse and carrying an axe in one hand and a holly bough in the other. He demanded a challenge for King Arthur to cut off his head in exchange for a return of the blow in one year. Gawain, eager to prove himself, accepts the challenge in Arthur's place so the king won't sully his good name. Gawain cuts off the knight's head in one stroke. The knight picks up his head, bows, and leaves. Nearly one year later, Gawain goes on a quest to find the Green Knight and complete the challenge. Take note, Gawain leaves in November, interestingly, when summer wanes and winter is coming. He is due to meet the Green Knight on Christmas. Gawain has a difficult time finding the Green Chapel where the Knight lives. As the day grew closer, Gawain became worried he wouldn't find the chapel and make a bad name for King Arthur's Knights. Along the way, he meets Lord Bertilac, who says he knows where the Green Chapel is and Gawain should come back to his castle and rest. The way isn't far, so he has plenty of time. Gawain decides to go, and there he meets Lord Bertilac's wife, who is beautiful and kind. Also at the court is an ugly old woman who is treated with high regard. They feast together, and Lord Bertilac announces he will be hunting in the morning and makes a deal with Gawain to gift his guest with whatever he catches in exchange for the same from Gawain. Gawain agrees to this, and in the morning he is visited by Lady Bertilac in his chamber. There she attempts to seduce him, but Gawain courteously denies her, though she gives him one kiss. When Lord Bertilac returns in the evening, he gifts Gawain with the deer he had taken on his hunt. Gawain gives him one kiss as his gift, but does not reveal the source. The next day, Lord Bertilac goes hunting again with the same offer as the day prior. Lady Bertilac again tries to seduce him, but Gawain declines and she gives him two kisses. That evening, Lord Bertilac gifts Gawain with the boar he had hunted, and Gawain returns with two kisses, again not revealing the source. On the third day, while her husband is hunting again, Lady Bertilac tries to offer Gawain a gold ring but he declines. She offers him a green garter, which she says will magically protect Gawain from harm, and so he accepts her gift. She tells him to keep the gift a secret from her husband and gives him three kisses. That evening, Lord Bertilac gifts Gawain with a fox he had caught, and Gawain gives him three kisses, but does not tell of who gave them or of the sash. The next day, Gawain must leave as he is due to meet the Green Knight. When he arrives at the Green Chapel, Gawain ties the Green Garter around his waist for protection and faces the Green Knight. Gawain is prepared to accept the blow from the large Green Knight, but when he is bent with neck exposed, Gawain flinches as the Knight drops his axe. The Knight chides Gawain for his cowardice and prepares to deliver a second blow, which he teases Gawain with, testing his nerve. Gawain tells the knight to complete the bargain, and the knight drops the axe, but only gives him a small nick on his neck rather than the full beheading he expected. The knight reveals himself to be Lord Bertilac, who had been sent by Morgan Le Fay to test Arthur's knights. Morgan had been the old woman disguised at Lord Bertilac's feasting hall. Lord Bertilac praises Gawain for his bravery in completing the bargain, though the grazing of the axe blade was the price for lying about the sash from his wife. Gawain is ashamed for his deception, but the Green Knight holds no ill will and the men part as friends. Gawain pledges to wear the Green Garter as a reminder of his deception, and when he returns to King Arthur's courts, the other knights don a Green Garter as part of their armor henceforth as well, a symbol of honor and honesty. Obviously, that story is riddled with Gawain and nature symbolism, the changing of seasons, life and death, and sacrifice. These are really all of the things that make Gawain up into the character we love and value. He is regenerative, strong, and as enduring as the great river, as he said. The knight of the Fae is one with the land, as enduring as the great river, and as true as Arrowwind's bow. Gawain has a strong connection between the sun and his strength. When the sun shines and the summer seasons arrive, his strength is heightened, but as the season wanes, so does his power. Even in the dark of night, Gawain is weaker than during the day. With his association to life comes an association with death. It is here we find Gawain's connection with the horned god. The horned god is consort to the great goddess and has a symbolic death and rebirth every year. He is connected to nature, fertility, and new growth, but also connected to death. The horned god is an escort to the underworld, 
delivering souls to the afterlife. The death of the horned god is a sacrifice at Samhain to usher in winter and rest. When he is reborn in spring, he brings with him new life, the changing of seasons, nature, and sunlight. We can see Gawain's connection with all of these concepts. He is connected to nature, to sacrifice, and the sun. There is a connection with Gawain and a goddess figure in his relationship with the loathly lady motif, as well as his general lustiness equating to a fertility god, fitting into his role of the maiden's knight. Gawain encompasses the horned god motif in a variety of ways, including his horned helmet he wears, as well as absorbing the green knight's character in Cursed. The Green Knight himself is described as having green skin with leaves and branches growing from his body. The very fact that his head is cut off but then grows back is a connection to regenerative nature and endurance as well. And well, we can't really ignore the whole kissing of a man repeatedly. There are some who speculate, including me, on the idea of Gawain not only being lusty for women but also lusty for men further fitting into the idea of spreading his seed as a green nature figure. In the homosocial norms of the time, it was not out of the question for men to exchange a friendly kiss, so that wasn't actually too out there in comparison to our current heterosocial constructs. So guys, next time you see an old pal, give him a kiss, or two, or three. Homoeroticism is no stranger in Arthurian literature, so the gay Gawain trope is not a new idea nor is Gay Lancelot or Gay Arthur. Along with the Horned God's connection to the Underworld or Otherworld, Gawain has a few connections here as well. He has had such lovers as Helos, the Widow, claiming the horse of the Fairy Queen Esclaramond, and in more than one tale was said to have fathered a child upon a fae called Lori or Flory. But we must discuss his most famous encounter and close call with an otherworldly figure, which occurs in the stories of the Loathly Lady. These include the stories of the Wife of Bath's Tale, or the wedding of Sir Gawain and Dame Ragnell. The Loathly Lady motif has a close connection to the Kyliak, a goddess of sovereignty. She appears as an ugly old woman, Dame Ragnell, offering an act of valor to save King Arthur's life from her evil brother, Sir Gromer Somer, who challenges King Arthur to find out what women desire most in all the world. She demands for Sir Gawain, the king's bravest knight, to marry her and she will save the king's life. The old hag had told Arthur that even an owl can find a mate. For his king, Gawain agrees to the marriage, but the woman is hideous with warty skin, foul-smelling breath, and stringy black hair. When they are in the marriage bed, Gawain closes his eyes and prepares to feel the wrinkled old lips on his, but instead she transforms into a beautiful young maiden, a reward for his sacrifice for his king. She has the ability to remain beautiful by day but ugly by night, or ugly by day and beautiful by night, and she gives Gawain the choice. He cannot choose this for her, and so gives the choice back to her, which is all she or any woman wants, and is the moral of the story. Sovereignty, or the ability to choose for herself, gifts Gawain with a wife who is beautiful both by day and night. After her transformation, Gawain and Dame Ragnell remained happily married for five years and she even bore him a son, but then one day she disappeared, never to be seen again. Afterward, Gawain is said to have known many more ladies in his time. This shows a very strong connection between Gawain and the Kyliak, who is a goddess of sovereignty, has a strong association with owls, and had one son. It shows the contrast of Gawain as the horned god as well. When the Kyliak disappears, the horned god is able to spread his seed again. Remember Gawain's name stemming back to the Hawk of May, which seems a fitting combatant to the owl of the Kyliak. Considering the strong role the Kyliak plays in Cursed, we must consider the connection that Gawain has with her as well. They play a counterbalance to one another, similarly to the Kyliak and Brigid being summer and winter goddesses who must battle each other for the power of the seasons. The Horned God definitely plays into the summer aspect of this, and there are male counterparts of this cycle that we will explore further in the form of the Oak King and the Holly King. Remember, the Green Knight appears with a bow of holly in his hand. We must recall Gawain's death in Cursed. Nimue put forth all of her power to try and heal his wounds, 
protect him and bring him back, but she was unable to save his life. When he died, we saw the leaves of the hidden go autumn on his face, but also something more. Baby grass grew up and shrouded him, encasing him like a tomb. This is unusual and obviously an effect of Nimue's magic, and though she was unable to bring him back, did she plant him like a seed? My best guess is Gawain will fall into the regenerative cycle of the Horned God, considering the strong Kyliak storyline. Gawain even presents himself as a horned warrior with his horned helm and green armor. Speaking of the horned helm, where is it? The last we saw of it, the weeping monk was tossing it outside of Moikrig, attempting to lure Gawain out. I do believe this will come into play later in the story, especially in the weeping monk's future. Will he wear the helm, or will it be worn by the green knight arisen to reclaim the spring? Is it a symbolic replacement for the holly bough? Gawain and Lancelot have a complicated history, much of it coming down to skill. Gawain, being Arthur's nephew, has a place in line to the throne and is a favorite among the knights. Lancelot often comes into the picture later, dashing with his skill at arms. The two men have different builds, Gawain being large, broad, and bullish, and Lancelot agile, slim, and quick. Occasionally, Lancelot is a cousin to Arthur as well, with all of their mothers being sisters, but placing Lancelot in line to the throne as well, which of course creates some tension. When Lancelot and Guinevere begin their love affair, it's not a well-hidden secret in many stories. Often it is Mordred who arranges a coup in order to get rid of Guinevere, who brings shame upon King Arthur, and Lancelot, who is an untrustworthy snake. With Mordred being so intertwined with their families, whether he is Arthur's illegitimate son or one of Gawain's brothers, he has much to gain by exposing this affair. But it also comes from a desire to protect and preserve King Arthur. Gawain has a difficult time involving himself in the coup. He loves Lancelot like a brother, but Mordred convinces their other brothers, Gaheris and Gareth, to participate. To appease Gawain and prove he wants to go peacefully, Gareth, the youngest, goes unarmed, but in the commotion of exposing the lovers, Lancelot fights back in defense of himself and Guinevere. In the scuffle, Gareth and Gaheris are killed and Lancelot and Guinevere escape. Gawain is left insensibly angry and swears vengeance upon Lancelot. Lancelot would never kill the men intentionally. Lancelot loved all of Gawain's brothers and when he learned he killed Gareth, he is heartbroken himself and sometimes even loses his mind in remorse. There are variations from here. Sometimes Gawain leads an army against Lancelot, which leaves Camelot vulnerable to being usurped by Mordred. This leads Gawain and Lancelot to reconciling to reclaim Camelot. Other tales include Gawain fighting until he is upon his deathbed before realizing the error of his ways and seeking peace with Lancelot before he dies, pledging him to kill Mordred for their king. Or sadly, other tales include Lancelot dying without the men ever seeing each other again. In Cursed, we see a passing of the buck with Gawain and Lancelot. The men fight, and Lancelot wounds Gawain in the thigh, rendering him unable to walk. Have you heard the tale of the Fisher King? Well, we'll get there. Gawain also learns in that moment that Lancelot is Fae, and that he is strong enough to defeat him in a fight. The Fae need him. When Lancelot comes to see Gawain in Brother Salt's kitchen, Gawain begs him to become who he was meant to be and help their people. It is time to take his place among the Fae and be their great defender, especially now that Gawain cannot. When we see Gawain die and become encased by the grassy tomb, we also simultaneously see the weeping monk become the Fae's defender. He saves Squirrel, he removes his hood, and he becomes Lancelot. Gawain's sacrifice brought that forth in Lancelot. The Fisher King is a figure in Arthurian legend going back to the story Percival by Chrétien de Troyes. Percival is the central figure in the story, though Gawain attempts to find the Grail as well, and both encounter the Fisher King separately. He is an old king in a line meant to protect the Grail. He received a leg, or groin wound, rendering him unable to walk and unable to procreate. The wound makes him unfit to protect the Grail, and he needs a noble to come along and ask a certain question to heal him. The health of the land is tied to the health of the Fisher King, and until he is healed, his lands are a barren wasteland where nothing will grow. All he can do is fish in his boat until the right noble comes along. 
I see a strong connection to the Fisher King in the wound that Gawain received from Lancelot, which rendered him unable to walk. Will the land fail in his absence? I think we can expect Gawain to be reborn at a later time and hopefully save the Fae just in the nick of time. He has been their savior, their guide, a figure to look to through the struggle the Fae have endured. Even Nimue finds comfort in him, and with him being gone, she was supposed to be their guiding light. Losing Nimue and Gawain will be a massive blow to the Fae. Will Lancelot be able to take their place, and will the Fae trust him to do so? Gawain has not always been portrayed as a good person, which may be something else to consider. I mean, if he comes back from the dead, is he somewhat of a white or a zombie? Will he still be the comforting green knight that the Fae seek for protection? There is a history of villainizing Gawain in Arthurian literature. His perfect knight trope was toyed with, creating depth and range for him. In the prose Tristan, his character is flipped completely and he was portrayed as murderous, bloodthirsty, and a rapist of damsels. Many authors play with this idea of Gawain being an imperfect knight and a combination of both good and evil. This even plays into his inability to find the grail, as he was not seeking it with a pure heart, but for more magical meals and drinks rather than a desire to find the grail or save the Fisher King's lands. There are tales of Gawain as a womanizer, sleeping with the wife of a lord who offered him sanctuary, or rescuing a lady only to become her lover. The point I'm getting at is, might we see Gawain presented differently than we know him once he is reborn? Will he encompass the frightening facade of the Green Knight of Legend, an axe-wielding nature god with a horned helm and the power of the hidden coursing through his veins? Will he even have a personality, or will he be a sort of solar-powered nature zombie? Will he be kind and protective, or will he be corrupted from death and rebirth? As a whole, we can definitely see some recurring themes for Gawain's storylines in various tales. Whether it's his connection to the Green Knight, the Horned God, the Fisher King, or the Oak King, he is firmly rooted in the themes of fertility and cyclical nature. Similarly to many Arthurian works, he has a guideline or trope to play off for character building, and his is of the Green Man motif. Gawain is a fascinating character and one of the most layered and interesting knights of Arthurian legend. There are so many tales he is intertwined with, but he also has some amazing stories of his own. I hope you all enjoyed learning more about Gawain the Green Knight. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below and what do you think the future holds for Gawain? What are some of your favorite stories he is in? Let me know if there are any characters in Arthurian lore you'd like for me to deep dive on and explain. I plan to do some work on the Weeping Monk next, so ladies, watch out for your boy. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye. How could you?